Welcome Internet to Psychoanalytic Talk and today we're going to be talking about the concept that everyone has heard about and everyone has an opinion on but most people don't really know what it fundamentally means namely the Oedipus complex so one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this complex is that it's often mis completely misunderstood both in terms of its aims in terms of what place it holds and in terms of how it has developed so nowadays most people feel that it's mumbo jumbo and that it doesn't hold any water but this tool since that very interesting with that idea which has been kind of trivialized uh, throughout the decades and a bit i would say even cheapened sometimes but what i found fundamentally interesting is that it holds the role of something that is of the essence of a personality, at least for Freud, and that has a main impact on the becoming of an individual. So I'm going to go back to the real, to the core of what the Oedipus complex is. So for Freud, the Oedipus complex is the man mental organizator, meaning that basically this is going to be the framework from which all of human personality will be built. Uh, for now, I'm just going to explain the concept. I'm not going to give any criticisms. So that um, complex manifests by for the for the human male, right, or at least the one assigned at birth, is going to develop in in this way, basically. There is going to be incestuous desires for the mother, of course, unconsciously, but consciously little children of three to five are going to really want to be with one parent rather than the other. That's how it manifests. And that's what allowed for it to elaborate. But basically that child is going to um, wish to be close to mother and he's going to see the father as a rival, as someone that is still in a way mother to him. And in order to prevent that, there's going to be onsets of ag aggression and aggressivity from that part of that child. It's going to try and push away father and have mother all to himself. This, that's the Freudian idea. And what's going to happen is that at some point, father's going to react and put a limit. There is going to be what is called a castration complex, meaning the father's going to threaten to um, cut off um, the phallus of the child if the child doesn't uh, cooperate and forsake his incestuous desires. And for fear of losing a bit of himself, the child is going to comply reluctantly and is going to basically repress all of the Oedipal um, phenomena into the unconscious and go on with his personality uh, with that fundamental taboo and forbiddenness within inside him. Now that's for the boy. For the little girl, it's going to be quite different because basically um, it's when she realizes what she lacks, mainly a phallus, that she's going to be um, willing to have it. Seeing that she's not given the phallus, she's going to basically uh, resent the mother because the mother doesn't have it either, but she's going to admire her father, meaning that she's going to go to her father. And going to her father, she realizes that father's never going to give it that, that organ to her, never. So this, for Freud, there's a slip that the phallus is going to become for the young chi female child. It's going to be, become a child and the wish to give a child and to bear a child. And that's going to be the, basically the equivalent of the Oedipus complex but for the girl. So that's for Freud. So what you have to understand is that that's the main framework for Freud. And he felt that after those developments, personality grew out of it, that this was a fundamental frame of it. But, and this is a big but, it's, um, it's a complex that has its limits, meaning that basically uh, a lot of people have come afterwards to try and amplify it, to try and transform it a bit, because 
This sense that Freud kind of neglected throughout his practice, mainly what we call pre oedipal And all that pre oedipal um, phenomena was kind of not seen by Freud or minimized. Like, the influence and importance was mainly the Oedipus. For Freud, that was the big, big uh, center of all the unconscious phenomena. What we feel now is that there's much more, in terms of intensity, prior to the Oedipus complex. And once the Oedipus is reached, then basically it makes for a good mental frame, one that can bear with illness or one that creates neurosis. Whereas if there's issues beforehand, mainly with separation, with paranoid anxiety, with um, a fundamental uh, issue at the very start, it makes the Oedipus impossible, at least not in a constitutional, uh, fruitful way, at least. And that's why it becomes very interesting, um, because Freud, by dismissing that, or by being very reluctant to even admit that there's something beyond there, even though he kind of, like, implies it, but he doesn't want to go that way. So we're left with a Freud that gives the Oedipus complex a massive, um, a massive, massive space. And that space is often mocked by everyone, psychoanalysts included. That basically everything is linked to the desire to have mother or the desire to have father, given the cases. But Freud made it much more subtle than that, that he felt that basically it, the Oedipus could be neg- what he called negative, meaning that the, that the male child could be attracted to the father and the female child could be attracted to the mother. So it's much more subtle, but... The idea, and the idea is that Freud tried to transmit, was that there was an ultimate taboo, and that taboo will be the start of the um, reflection of Lacan. When Lacan's going to think about psychoanalysis, he says that basically it's not that much the incestuous desires that are fundamentally so important in the Oedipus complex. What's important is the fact that someone, a third party, be it the father, society, an uncle, uh, another woman, it can be anyone. But the third party has put a stop to uh, a f- fusion-like state between between caregiver and child, or mother and child, if we're in a classic uh, tr- triangle of relationships. And that someone has stopped it and said, no, you can't be all the time with mother, you have to grow out of it. Or you can't all the time be with father, you have to grow out of it. You have to make space for something new, to desire something else. And that is the fundamental baseline of what we understand now, that the Oedipus complex, with all its lasting power, has mainly a focus on the forbiddenness, meaning that there's something that stopped, there's something that a fundamental rule that can never be transgressed. And we do see that in cases of, um, for example, of people who haven't, unfortunately, haven't had or haven't been able to develop to that point, that the rules regarding incest or murder might be very re- relative, meaning even, not even operational, meaning that the person does not have a barrier to do those sins. And that's how at least psychoanalytic theory thinks about sins, how people that don't have that fundamental stopping block might go through much more severe actions and acting out than people that do, which is a very interesting frame when you think about it. But there's also a whole cultural perspective, because for Freud, the Oedipus complex was universal. So he would disregard what I've just said, saying, no, 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 everyone goes through it, it's just more or less um, structuring. But how we understand since now is that some people don't go through it. There's this beautiful quote of Winnicott in one of Guntrip's um, essays, where Winnicott tells Guntrip after the, um, one of the sessions that there is no eatable complex within Guntrip. And... I found that very interesting, is that even Winnicott started moving away from it. And I think that a lot of psychoanalysis have kind of moved away from it. Of course, there is that great tradition of keeping it, but it's becoming more and more 
uh, background for it. Like it's one of the operators. But I have the feeling sometimes, that, at least in French psychoanalysis, that once you've reached the Oedipus complex, right, you've kind of made it out and you're at the better or more subtle ways of dealing with life or in terms of personality, which I don't think is necessarily accurate, right? But it's kind of the effect that has on me. Like that's the top of the pop slayers and everything else is kind of uh, sources of issues or suffering. And I don't think it's quite right either, right? I think that all of these things are ways of seeing. And nowadays we have that Oedipal and pre-Oedipal cutoff line, which Freud did not have. And it's something that is still a massive framework. But basically, the more we go, the less I feel that the Oedipus complex has that much of an explaining power. And if I were to be given a guess, I think it's because it's been so trivialized, so mocked, so belittled, that it's kind of just faded also. It's taken virtually now as a given. And I think that that's a shame because there's still a lot of interesting phenomena with the Oedipus complex and with the forbiddenness that comes with it, all the incestuous wishes, which always seem terrible, like everyone hates that, right? <laughs> but it's still very interesting because it's true that these things still summon so many emotions, so many feelings of disgust, of rejection, of just complete uh, dumbfoundedness that... It remains something that I feel is still very, very charged emotionally. And that emotional charge, at least in my eyes, makes it that Freud might not have been so wrong after all, that there is something to it, that these things might be more structuring or destructuring than meets the eye. And I don't think it's quite fair to dismiss everything Freud said because we don't like it or feel that it's disgusting. It's maybe because if we feel it's disgusting, that there's something to investigate. So I do think that the Oedipus complex still has a lot of interesting phenomena and can explain a lot of things of importance, but I don't think it should be the only tool within a psychoanalysis toolbox. I think that that would be a, a grave mistake, as developments like the ones of Melanie Klein or Karen Horn and I are still incredible and I think I still have a lot of staying power and explaining power that the Oedipus complex doesn't always have or not in the way Freud would have wanted. So that pretty much sums it up. What you have to remember is that basically um, the child, when it happens, chooses to self-preserve himself rather than to go forward with his desires. And that uh, giving, giving up, that action of giving up, is what brings the human, the little human, into civilization and into society itself. So it's very interesting that, in a way, it mirrors the depressive position, I think, a bit. It's like giving up that powerfulness. And there is that element of, finally, in the end, it's self-preservation than to give up one's desire. So that's the fundamental crux of the Oedipus complex, is that dichotomy between desire on one side and forbiddenness and rules and the effect of having to follow them on the other. So I hope it made things more clear as I stated them. So, of course, I am in two minds with the Oedipus complex, so it's not an easy, how can I say, an easy complex to... I think, understand thoroughly and totally as it, is, it has its nuances. But I also think that there's a lot of things to be said and mainly about the female version of it because I think Freud, at least for the male part, yeah. I mean, it, it's. I think it does pan out pretty well. But female-wise, mm, not so sure. But that might be the development of another video. But for now, I'll let you ponder on this. I just wanted to say that it's not as simplistic as people make out to be, be it the layman or the psychoanalyst. Anyway, I'll see you in the next one.